Hi, Chris Hughes here. I'm the Chief Security Advisor with Endor Labs, and today I'll be discussing the impact of government mandates on application security. So first off, how did we get here? You know, how did we get to the situation where software supply chain security has been a critical topic across the ecosystem, including the federal landscape? Uh, so there's several factors here that I want to call out. First up is Sonotype's eighth annual State of the Software Supply Chain report, which showed that there was a 742% average annual increase in software supply chain attacks over the past three years. Another study here that was titled uh, a Quant's View of Software Supply Chain Sur Security shows the rapidly increasing number of attacks over the years, you know, especially in the last, say, five to eight years when it comes to software supply chain attacks. And there's various reasons that this has been, this has been happening. Uh, among those is the fact that malicious actors have been giving more and more attention to the software supply chain. Uh, they've seen that there's a, a more efficiency when it comes to attacking software supply chain entities, whether we're talking proprietary software vendors or uh, open source software, uh, third party components that are used in uh, applications across the ecosystem, for example, is a higher return on investment. I can attack a, a single organization and just compromise that organization, for example, and their environment or their data, or I can target a, a large software supply chain a provider, a software supplier or manufacturer, or a widely used open source software component, for example, and have that cascading impact downstream across the entire ecosystem of consumers and customers that use it. Um, we'll be talking about that more moving forward. Also, the supply chain has been often overlooked when we think about cybersecurity. Uh, for example, there's been a longstanding push to, you know, move things uh, to the point of having a zero trust environment. You know, as we hear, no, no more queuing, QE centers. Uh, moving away from the legacy approaches of a uh, kind of the perimeter-based uh, security model, the castle and moat type model. Organizations have been bolstering their own security practices and processes and organizations and things of that nature. Uh, but if you can compromise a single entity, a single, you know, widely used software supply chain entity, like a, a large uh, proprietary software vendor or a widely used open source software com component, for example, you can have that downstream cascading impact across thousands of organizations, millions of users, and it's just far, far more efficient and far more enticing for the malicious actor, for example. Uh, so a single compromise, as I said, can have a cascading effect. And I want to call out a couple that we've all heard and talked about, of course, you know, but just to set the kind of tone for the conversation a little bit. Of course, the first one is SolarWinds, you know, this proprietary third party software uh, that's used by many organizations, including federal agencies, uh, you know, across the federal landscape, uh, had a compromise uh, of their build processes and environments and had a malicious, you know, uh, release of the software essentially go out to downstream consumers, including federal agencies. Uh, Department of Defense, Defense entities, intelligence community entities, things of that nature. Uh, but of course, those widely used uh, open source software components, for example, uh, like Log4j is another big one. And this one's interesting because, you know, not only does it impact organizations and enterprises that are using these components themselves and have to go and kind of scour their environment to see where it is, it also impacts, you know, most large uh, software providers. Like think about the Amazons, the Microsofts, uh, you know, uh, uh, the widely used proprietary software. They're all using these open source software components in their applications as well. Uh, so it impacts uh, many, many organizations as well as all their consumers that are using them. Uh, so, uh, like I said, it, you know, it's kind of a situation where organizations are left, you know, struggling to understand, you know, where do I have this in my environment? What systems are impacted? What mitigating controls can I put in place? You know, how do I go about addressing this? If it's a, a proprietary piece of software, for example, you know, do I contact the vendor and understand what, you know, what they're doing about this? If they have a, a patch coming out, if they've addressed the deficiencies that have called, caused the incident, or if it's a widely used open source software component, for example, which which of my suppliers, my software suppliers, organizations that I'm consuming software from are using this component and are impacted by it? Is it exploitable, for example, in their software, in their you know uh, service that I'm consuming, as well as in my own internal environment? Where do I have this piece of software? You know, is it impacting my organization, uh, my stakeholders, my data, uh, things of that nature? Uh, for example, we saw the Cybersecurity Safety Review Board. They found that agencies spent tens of thousands of hours trying to find vulnerable dependencies, such as Log4j. After that incident, one agency was reported as spending 33,000 hours just trying to figure out where in the environment do I even have this component, let alone is it exploitable? Uh, what are we doing about it? What mitigating controls do we have in place? You know, what uh, what's the system criticality or business sensitivity or data sensitivity? I'm sorry of, of the systems that are impacted. Uh, so it has this massive downstream impact that can cause a lot of toil on organizations. Just understanding where they're even impacted and what they can do about it. 
Uh, and we all know that the open source software ecosystem has continued to grow tremendously. Uh, to the right here, I wanted to show this, you know, CNCF uh, landscape, uh, just to show you, you know, just some of the uh, the ecosystem we have here. There's a, a whole proliferation proliferation of tools and projects that are really promising and innovative things that can be consumed and used by organizations. Uh, but with that, you know, comes some trade offs. Uh, we, you know, just to throw some metrics out there about the open source software growth. Uh, Ninety seven percent of organizations say they're using open source software. Seventy seven percent of those organizations are planning to increase their open source software usage. And we're seeing a lot of growth in particular areas around DevOps and cloud native CICD tooling, uh, things like Kubernetes and Istio and, and on and on. You know, these projects are growing tremendously, getting a lot of adoption. And for a lot of great reasons, these are innovative communities. Uh, it can expedite, you know, your time to delivery rather than needing to create everything from scratch. You can simply go use an open source software project or component uh, to accelerate your software delivery, uh, you know, save yourself time and money and energy and effort. And also, you know, lean into that robust community of open source software maintainers and contributors uh, that provide these, uh, you know, really promising services and, and projects out there for the community. Uh, that said, there's some trade offs there, some negative aspects of, you know, the software supply chain when it comes to open source software. Uh, as I talked about, you know, uh, open source software has continued to grow tremendously. Experts estimate that 60 to 80 percent of modern software is now comprised of open source software. That's a figure from the Linux Foundation. Uh, and most of these projects are supported by unpaid volunteers, people who are typically, you know, not being compensated for what they're doing. They're doing it in their own free time. Um, and, you know, they they simply are just doing this because they enjoy being part of the community or being part of the project and, you know, contributing back to the ecosystem. Uh, but the issue that comes from this is a lot of organizations simply don't understand, you know, their their open source software usage, as we talked about previously. Where do they have these components in their environment, uh, in their own internally developed applications, for example, in their enterprise? Or where have we pushed out products or, you know, versions of products or services, et cetera, uh, that have these open source software components that are being, uh, that are now, you know, potentially vulnerable. And we've seen, uh, you know, despite the fact that there's this robust community of open source software, there's also a high bus factor. Uh, so for example, you know, there, there's a study that shows that 25% of projects have a single maintainer. Uh, you know, 25% of all open source software projects have a single maintainer maintaining that project. And 94% have 10 or less uh, people maintaining a project, for example. Uh, so we have these open source software projects and components. Uh, they're being widely used by, you know, uh, other software vendors, uh, enterprise organizations as they develop software internally or externally for customers. And this ecosystem is being held up by this very small group of people often, you know, doing it in their own free time and voluntarily not being compensated for it. Uh, and that can play a part in terms of incentives around responding to things or addressing vulnerabilities, you know, prioritizing security. Uh, you know, the, the fact that most of these folks are doing this voluntarily has implications for, you know, what they're willing to focus on or how quickly they may respond in some cases. Uh, and organizations have a false sense of security, you know, in some cases around open source software thinking that, oh, it's, you know, everyone's using this. It's secure. It's good. Uh, you know, we don't need to worry about it, but that's simply not the case in many cases. Uh, and I wanted to show this image here from Fortress Security on the left. And this really demonstrates, you know, the increased attention when we look at, uh, you know, uh, malicious actors as they look at the software supply chain and look at, uh, you know, uh, widely used proprietary software or open source software components, for example. And they still try to target these things uh, more and more. And you can see this timeline from Fortress Security just in the last, you know, they put a, a window out over a two year period. Uh, whether it's a, a proprietary vendor like a Microsoft or a CodeCov who are being impacted or an open source software component and, and project that's being impacted. And it's not only from, you know, uh, known vulnerabilities that are being exploited. It could be other attack uh, uh, vectors and types too, like things like dependency confusion or typo squatting, uh, just trying to play on the social engineering aspect of the developers that are using these open source software components. Uh, so from there, you know, I wanted to set the tone of, you know, <clears throat> thinking about the government requirements and mandates that are starting to come out. And the federal government has been uh, putting a tremendous amount of attention on the software supply chain, uh, trying to bolster software supply chain security, for example. Uh, so first up, obviously, you know, in 2021 came out the Cybersecurity Executive Order, Executive Order 14028, uh, also known as Improving the Nation's Cybersecurity. And that executive order touches on a tremendous amount of things, you know, things from incident response, uh, data sharing, implementing a zero trust architecture. But it had an entire section, section four, uh, which was dedicated to enhancing software supply chain security. And what it did is it tasked various agencies and entities, you know, uh, to come up and produce guidance around secure software development, identification of critical software, uh, new requirements when we look at federal procurement, how the uh, federal government buys and procures software. Uh, and you may, you know, and I'll get to this later in the presentation, but, you know, you may think this doesn't really apply to you, but the federal government uh, spends tens of billions of dollars a year on IT services and software. Uh, so the chances are, even if you aren't directly working with the government, chances are, you know, you have a, uh, someone in your supply chain, whether a consumer or a supplier, 
uh, you know, who is working with the federal government to some extent. And, and these, you know, these kind of requirements have a way of having a trickle down effect across the ecosystem, uh, which is exactly what the government's after is trying to use that massive purchasing power to drive these systemic changes when we look at software supply chain security. Now, so that's section four of the executive order. You can see on the left, it laid out, you know, various activities, you know, starting with its public publication and then, you know, identification of critical software, uh, tasking NIST uh, to come up with secure software development guidelines, which we'll discuss here in a moment. Uh, so it really laid out the slew of activities that, you know, has continued to occur over the last several months and even years since its publication. And we're going to dive into some of those here and see what they are and, you know, what kind of changes are coming to the federal landscape when we look at software. Now, so first up is a, a memo from the Office of Management and Budget, also known as OMB. And it's OMB 2218. It came out in September of 2022. And it's titled Enhancing the Security of Software Supply Chain Through Secure Software Development Practices. Uh, so what this did is it starts to push those federal procurement changes that I talk about, uh, and it comes through the form of what they call the FAR, the Federal Acquisition Regulation. It's starting to push these changes out to the federal ecosystem when we look at federal agencies, how they procure software, you know, how they consume software from third-party software suppliers and try to push these requirements out across their, uh, you know, supply chain, basically, to ensure that the federal agencies that are using software, using software that's secure, has been developed with secure, so secure software development practices, uh, and they're mitigating the risk uh, to themselves and the people that depend on them. We're talking about critical citizen services, whether you're thinking Medicare and Medicaid, uh, Veterans Affairs, you know, uh, you may have military treatment facilities, Department of Defense, you know, doing national security missions. Uh, so it really has a massive impact across our ecosystem and our society and, and things that we depend on as a, as a civilization, to be honest with you. Uh, so what it is, it starts to push these uh, requirements out, requiring that software suppliers selling uh, software to the federal government must align with NIST guidance, as I talked about previously, which came in the form of Secure Software Development Framework, SSDF. And we're going to do a deep dive on that one soon. Uh, but what happened is NIST came out and published an, an update to an, a previous version of SSDF. And I'll do a deep dive on that in a, a future slide. Uh, so organizations that, you know, whether it applies to in agencies' information systems or impacts agency data, any software that's being used in those environments kind of comes under the purview of this OMB memo. Uh, and, and it started to apply to, you know, not only existing, so uh, not only new software, you know, consumed or purchased after the date of the memo, uh, but existing software, too, that's been identified, you know, as having a major change, as they dub it, uh, since the memorandum's publication, you know, as well as SAS and software using things like CICD or continuous delivery. Uh, so, you know, modern software development practices and delivery mechanisms, it, it applies to those as well. You know, obviously, there's some nuances to what will be a major change, uh, and I'm sure that there'll be some, you know, gamification from software suppliers and the agencies, you know, to kind of what categorizes as a major change or not to maybe delay the impact of these uh, these you know requirements on their on their suppliers or or the burden it may cause. But you know, that's the uh, the word that they used in their publication. Uh, another interesting aspect of this memo is it actually required the suppliers to address uh, security of third party components, open source software. So this is kind of an open acknowledgement from the federal uh, ecosystem that, you know, software suppliers, proprietary software vendors that are selling software to the federal government, they're responsible not only for their first party code, you know, software that they've created themselves. Uh, but they're also responsible for any third party components that they put in their software. So think open source software components or libraries or dependencies that they include. Uh, they're required to take, you know, uh, appropriate risk uh, management measures and governance around those open source software components. Uh, and the most potentially, um, you know, controversial aspect of what it did is it, it called for these suppliers to start to produce what's called self-attestation, uh, saying that they followed a risk based approach uh, to secure software development. Uh, so that means that, you know, software suppliers are going to have to start signing a, a document, you know, going on the record saying that, yes, we are using secure software development practices uh, when we produce this software that we sold to the government, whether as a SaaS or whether as a, a you know, self-hosted uh, proprietary software, software that will be hosted in a federal uh, environment or consume uh, and interact with federal agency data. Uh, we have followed this, you know, secure software development framework as it's been prescribed. Uh, and agencies also are able to, you know, uh, produce, uh, require other artifacts from these software suppliers, things such as a software bill of materials, for example, or wanting to see source code integrity measures in place, or seeing that the software supplier has a vulnerability disclosure program in place so that, you know, we all know that vulnerabilities will occur no matter what. Uh, but do these software suppliers have a vulnerability disclosure program in place so they can notify the federal agencies that are consuming that software? 
Uh, and it also allowed for, you know, some deficiencies or deviations from the requirements uh, of SDF, SSDF and the other requirements that it points out. And it uses the term uh, plan of action and milestone or a POAM, which is just a, a way that the federal government kind of documents deficiencies uh, uh, aligned with, you know, their federal ecosystem, their systems, their data. You know, say you can't implement MFA or you have some challenges around, you know, implementing uh, source code analysis, for example. Uh, you may be able to work with the federal agency that's pur purchasing the software and implement a POAM, which means, you know, you have some mitigating controls in place, you have a plan of how to address the deficiency, you have a timeline for when you will be addressing the deficiency, uh, things of that nature. Oh, so following up that memo that came out uh, the previous year in June 2023, uh, they released another memo, OMB 2316, and this basically reaffirmed the approach of the government, you know, forcing these suppliers to test these secure software development practices. And it also started to extend the timeline for the agencies to be, begin collecting these, these attestations from software suppliers. Uh, many people panicked, said, hey, uh, the agencies aren't prepared to start collecting these and they don't have a mechanism to ingest these processes, analyze the input of these attestations, uh, software suppliers haven't had necessarily enough time to kind of get their head around these requirements and align with them appropriately and begin to attest to them. Uh, so what they did is they said, you know, okay, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to extend the timeline to three months after this, uh, the self-attestation form is finalized, which we'll be talking about in a second. Then software suppliers now need to start self-attesting, uh, self um, you know, to these software, uh, secure software development practices. And something I wanted to call out that I meant to mention in the previous slide is it also opened the door, the previous memo opened the door to federal agencies not only getting a self-attestation, but in some cases, if they, you know, have uh, concerns around risk, or they think it's a high assurance environment or system that really needs to, you know, have a, additional measures and rigor, they can start to request a third party attestation uh, of these environments, these secure software development practices, and so on from a supplier. Uh, so there's, you know, obviously, you know, the age old kind of paradigm of first versus third party, you know, self attestation versus uh, third party attestation. Uh, and that's important because we've seen in the federal ecosystem, they started off doing uh, what's called uh, C, uh, 871, which is a NIST publication of defense industrial based suppliers had to attest, you know, that we are following this NIST 871. We're doing all the things that are documented in their terms of security controls. Uh, but they saw many defense industrial based suppliers get, you know, kind of pilfered by nation states and people stealing intellectual property, you know, military systems designs, things of that nature, you know, billions of dollars of, of potentially R&D. Uh, so they moved to a third party attestation model. So here we're starting off with a first, you know, or self part or self attestation model. Uh, but don't be surprised if you see in some cases agencies start to request a third party or even a push down the road for third party to be kind of the norm. Uh, as we know that there's there's kind of a, a trade off. Uh, obviously, self attestation is much faster and easier and less cumbersome on suppliers. Uh, but there's also the risk that they may not be thorough enough or they may not be forthcoming. For example, if revenue and contracts are on the line, it may push for a third party attestation. Uh, so moving on from that, as I talked about, they extended that timeline saying three months after this, you know, this memo is published uh, now uh, after the three months after the self-attestation form is finalized, I'm sorry, now we have to start to align with these requirements. So currently uh, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Agency, CISA, released a draft of the self-attestation common form, as they call it. And it lays out some specific SSDF practices that must be attested to, you know, just listing a few of them here, things like secure development and build environments, implementing logging, monitoring and auditing, uh, multi-factor authentication, providing provenance of third party components, uh, you know, implementing vulnerability scans and due diligence. It also talks about securing your open source software, third party components that you're consuming, understanding that you've you know taken measures to ensure you're including, you know, uh, non-vulnerable or you're, you know, kind of assessing the risk of the third-party uh, open source software components you're using and several other requirements. You can go dig into this form and check it out, uh, but it starts to lay out specifics of what software suppliers are going to have to sign on the line saying they've done. And it must be signed by the CEO or another uh, kind of equivalent leader that's responsible for product uh, development and shipping development uh, uh, products, you know, shipping uh, products down to consumers or customers. Uh, so this is putting a pretty uh, on onerous, you know, situation on the uh, organization to go out there and attest with a, by uh, an executive that yes, we have done these things. We have filed this secure software development framework. We have implemented these secure software development practices. Uh, and we're putting our name on the line saying that we've done these things. Uh, this also raises some concerns for some folks around the False Claims Act, for example. Uh, we've seen an uptick in these kind of activities, you know, uh, government potentially opening the door to pursue, you know, a False Claims Act if they feel that, you know, organization or entity uh, made a false claim to the government. Uh, so definitely something to think about, you know, when you're a software supplier selling to the government that you're truly doing these things that you say you are doing and you've, you know, kind of signed on a dotted line. Uh, 
uh, saying that you're doing them, you know, there's some legal or regulatory ramifications if, you know, if it turned out to not be true, for example. Uh, next up, the one I want to talk to you about, we've talked about the NIST Secure Software Development uh, Framework quite a bit, SSDF, which is the, the requirement that the supplier signing to the federal government is going to have to uh, align with. And uh, so what happened here is as part of the Cybersecurity Executive Order, uh, NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technologies, uh, published a new uh, version of their Secure Software Development Framework, SSDF, as it's called for short. Uh, and anyone who's been in the industry know that every time there's some kind of incident or situation, uh, we see a new, uh, another framework, another model, another, you know, kind of compliance scheme that we have to align with. And luckily in this case, OWA, our, our NIST, I'm sorry, they held various workshops with the community and they engaged with academia, industry, and others. And what they did is they rallied around existing frameworks and, and models in many cases, uh, things like OWASP uh, Software Assurance Maturity Model, uh, OWASAM as, it call, as it's called, or Synopsys, uh, Building Security and Maturity Model, among many others that they, they uh, cite as well. You can go dig in and see how they cross-reference cross essentially these practices to existing frameworks or existing models that the industry is familiar with and using to produce secure software. And it's thought to address the fact that, you know, there's very few software development lifecycle models out there specifically focused on software security. So they're trying to address that gap. Uh, and SSDF is organized into four different groups, uh, you know, of security practices, things like preparing the organization, uh, protecting the software, uh, producing well-secured software, and responding to vulnerabilities. So you think about throughout the SDLC, you're preparing your organization to be a software supplier, to produce software. You're starting to put measures in place to protect the software. You're starting to, you know, kind of do security activities and processes to produce well-secured software. And then ultimately, you're being in a position to respond to a vulnerability. As we say in cybersecurity, it's not a matter of uh, if it's a matter of when uh, there will be a vulnerability, how are you going to respond to that? Do you have vulnerability disclosure programs in place? How are you going to communicate with your uh, customers or consumers downstream and pass that information along? And that's where things like responding to vulnerabilities come into play. And it lays out, you know, various practices. These activities include things like identi ad identifying and documenting security requirements, uh, establishing roles and responsibilities across your organization for people producing and uh, contributing to the software, uh, implementing tools and tool chains, you know, think about things like SAST or DAS or uh, software composition analysis and so on. And then how are you going about, you know, identifying and tracking vulnerabilities and pushing them through the process towards remediation, or at least implementing mitigating controls and communicating those things out to your customers, as I talked about with a vulnerability disclosure program, for example. Uh, so it's being used as the bench line that, you know, these software suppliers signed to the federal government uh, must start to align with when we talk about these self-attestations or third-party attestations in some cases. Uh, so if you're a software supplier signed to the federal government, you absolutely must be familiar with uh, SSDF because uh, that's where they're rallying around uh, in, in terms of, you know, these these requirements, the forms that you're going to have to sign, the security requirements you're going to have to meet. Uh, so I definitely think it's important that organizations producing software, selling software to the federal government or who have aspirations of selling software to the federal government uh, definitely become familiar and recognize uh, the SSDF and dig into that, see what the security practices are, uh, perform a gap analysis of, you know, what are we doing so far in terms of our secure software development practices and, and our life cycle? And, you know, what gaps do we have around practices? How can we start to address those gaps? You know, do we need additional tooling? Uh, do we need to formalize some more roles and responsibilities? Do we need to implement more process rigor in terms of how we identify, track, remediate vulnerabilities or communicate them to customers and consumers and things like that? So definitely dig into those practices. And last but not least, I wanted to touch on one that applies uh, to the FDA, uh, the Federal Dr uh, Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act, FDNC Act, as they call it. It applies to Section 524B, and it's titled Ensuring the Cybersecurity of Medical Devices. Uh, and this one's interesting because, you know, it, it kind of emphasizes cyber physical systems. We're starting to see the convergence of software playing a part in every aspect of society. You know, you think of things like uh, consumer goods, things we use around our house, the natural, you know, uh, entertainment and leisure activities, but also critical things like critical infrastructure, you know, uh, electricity, utilities, uh, you know, water treatment facilities, medical devices in, in this case. Uh, so software is playing, playing a critical role across our society. And this is kind of a recognition of that by the FDA. And what it did is it pushes out these new requirements for pre-market submissions to uh, to the FDA for cybersecurity and medical devices. So if you're using software to produce a medical device and uh, your medical device is powered or enabled or uses software to some extent, uh, it's going to be applicable underneath this one. And what it does is it calls out various risk management activities that you must be doing, uh, one of which is producing a software bill of materials. Uh, we haven't went into real de depth on what that is, but a software bill of materials is essentially a nested inventory of software that's uh, contained uh, or components, I'm sorry, that is contained in a piece of software at different libraries or dependencies uh, 
uh, things of that nature. Uh, it initially got traction underneath the NTIA, which is a federal agency, that, and then the effort got moved underneath CISA, uh, who's leading the charge on SBOM. And there's two industry-leading standardized formats right now for an SBOM. Uh, you have the Lynx Foundation uh, a format that's been out there. And then you also have the Cyclone DX that's been led by OWASP. Uh, so these two different and in industry standardized, you know, uh, SBOM formats are kind of, you know, taking hold in the industry. Organizations are starting to, you know, starting to look at their, their software. How do we start to produce an SBOM? And there's a lot of tools, pro you know, from third party uh, vendors, for example, as well as open source software projects that can be used to produce an SBOM in many cases, especially for modern, you know, cloud native environments, uh, environments using CICD uh, or your source code environments, things of that nature. Uh, and then they also call out different other risk management activities, things like doing vulnerability assessments or produce, uh, you know, uh, connect, conducting activities like threat modeling. Uh, we've seen a lot of activity around uh, put, calling for secure by design, secure by default software and systems right now, especially from CISA. Uh, so performing activities like threat modeling is a great way to identify, you know, the, the kind of what are we doing? You know, how is it vulnerable? Who's looking to potentially compromise it? And how do we go about mitigating it? Mitigating it? Uh, so performing those threat modeling activities can help organizations take stock of, you know, what are the threats and the risks to the systems and software we're producing? What are some potential mitigations uh, that we can put in place or remediations of potential vulnerabilities, things of that nature? And as I talked about, it calls for a robust SBOM, a software build material that must include first and third party components. Uh, so this means that organizations producing, uh, you know, medical devices uh, must take stock of third party components, open source software components, et cetera, that are in these devices. Uh, and it acknowledges that open source software components are often used in these medical devices and they should be considered from the risk perspective. Uh, this means that your open source software components, you know, no longer can you just kind of use these components and say, oh, it, it, this isn't ours. This is, you know, an open source software project or someone else made this. You're integrating it into your product. You are now responsible for it. And that same kind of language is emphasized in the OMB memos, acknowledging that software suppliers are responsible for the third party open source software components they produce in their products because uh, that you're pushing that risk essentially down to the customer, to the consumer. Uh, and the suppliers, these manufacturers and vendors are in the best place to do something about this. They're the ones integrating these uh, third party components. They're the ones in the best position to kind of mitigate the risk and select, you know, secure components, whether it's known vulnerabilities or widely used uh, components or components that have, you know, hygiene around their, their uh, environments and how they allow people to contribute or authenticate, et cetera. Uh, and so it also talks about device suppliers should implement governance around open source software components in their products. This means, you know, no longer can you just use a bunch of open source software components and ship it in a medical device. You need to understand what components are in that device, you know, what are the risks associated with those and what are we doing about that? Uh, so that said, that kind of concludes the, uh, you know, various federal requirements and landscape I wanted to walk through when we think about software supply chain security. Uh, and I know some of you may be watching this, like I said, and thinking, hey, this doesn't really apply to me. We don't work with the federal government or we don't sell software or proxies to the federal government. Uh, but as I mentioned, the federal government uses, you know, they, they use a tremendous amount of software and IT systems. They can procure tens of billions of dollars every year in IT and services and software. Uh, so it's likely that, you know, many organizations are already working with the federal government. And if you aren't, you likely are a supplier of someone who is, or you may be working with someone who is working with the federal government. And they're going to start to kind of ask for these artifacts, ask for this information from their, you know, third party suppliers as well. Uh, and that said, you know, also we, we, kind of see a tendency for, you know, cybersecurity requirements that originate in the federal ecosystem or Department of Defense and so on to have kind of a trickle down effect across the ecosystem as, you know, as the federal government starts to adopt these things, uh, commercial industry, you know, starts to take a look at their best practices and the way they're doing things in some cases and say, you know, should we be implementing sim similar requirements? You know, how can we uh, up level our cybersecurity as well? Uh, so if you don't, you know, if you haven't been familiar with these requirements, hopefully this conversation was helpful. I definitely recommend, as I said, folks dig into uh, NIST Secure Software Development Framework. And I hope the summary of those OMB memos and how we've gotten here, you know, with the, the rise of software supply chain attacks and the cybersecurity executive order uh, was informative. Hope everyone has a great afternoon.